I was, uh, I think it was the first, I'm quite certain it was the first weekend I went down and I, and to, to Rachel's church. We hadn't been dating yet. In fact, my buddy Brian was the one who liked Rachel. And um, uh, we were sitting on the front pew playing music, of course. That's what we did. That was our lives. And uh, Rachel's dad came up to me, and he was like, uh, well, how do you say it? He's like, hey, can you do me a, hey, Schlick, can you do me a favor? Can you turn to Hezekiah chapter 16? I'm like, yes, sir. Like, oh, there is no Hezekiah. And he walks away laughing, and the little church boy didn't even get it, you know. Oh, man. Amen. Well, on the Isle of Patmos, we know that God used John to write the book of Revelation. We, we know that. And it would seem that God allowed suffering in John's life so that he could write the book of Revelation. It would seem that way, that God put him there at a certain place in time. Was he all by himself? Probably not. He was probably crushing rocks. But I'm sure at night he had a lot of time to himself. And it would seem like that God made that happen to put him in a place where he could be by himself for long periods of time. I'm speculating a little bit, but it sure seems that way. And while he's there, and by the way, it sure is easy. I was talking with Brother John this evening and this morning. Uh, we can look back on our lives and be like, yeah, that there was God moved here. You know, that God did, that was obviously God doing this to make this happen. We can look at it clearly. And even though we may not see it at the time, and I can point to times in my life where I would use the term suffering, thinking like, why is God allowing this? I'm serving him with all that I am. Everything that is in me, I'm serving the Lord. Yet these things are not happening. And now, because this isn't working, I have to do this, this, and this. And that just doesn't make sense to me. But looking back, I can be like, oh, I see what God was doing. He made that happen, so I'd be forced to go here to make this happen. I see it now. And sometimes we're going through something, we think, how is this even possible? But it's to grow us. I thought about that as, as, as John's on the Isle of Patmos. He's just serving the Lord. And, and, and he gets sent to this political island, essentially a prison, a uh, prison. Uh, 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 um, um, to, to get him out of the, the, the spotlight, uh, he, was, he was causing dissension among the politics and the leaders. And he was, he was becoming a problem because John was calling people out. And they're like, you got to go. So they made him go to the Isle of Patmos. But God allowed that to happen. So when we're suffering or we're going through something, it's not like, oh, the devil's out to get me every time. Oh, look at what the devil did. Oh, that person at work, blah, blah, blah. Everyone's trying to get me. It's everybody. Actually, if your heart is right and you're serving the Lord, maybe God's just growing you a little bit. So God wrote the book of Revelation through John. And in the beginning of the book, right, there's seven distinct letters, as we know, we've been going through them. There's specifically seven letters that are written to seven uh, uh, churches, specific churches at a specific time. You know, though they're written for specific churches at a specific time, they are still timeless. In fact, they absolutely are uh, applicable today. Just as the Old Testament scriptures were applicable to the New Testament, so is the complete canon of scripture applicable to us. Amen. Old Testament, New Testament. I want to say the notes that are in the Bible, but it's just not true. Amen. We see in the beginning of Revelation, just a, a really short recap, how God is represented in the midst of all seven churches, both visually to John in the midst of the candlesticks, but also in each of the salutations of the letters at the beginning of each one. And he, the salutations of... of, of uh, uh, Jesus Christ in different ways represented himself in different ways with different titles. You know, the seven churches we've studied, Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos and uh, Thyatira. And if I could draw your attention this evening to Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, we're going to look at what the Lord has to say about the church of Sardis. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1 says, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These thy works, and that thou hast uh, a name that thou livest, and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. 
Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore th uh, thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, uh, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the, sa the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Mr. Noah, would you pray for the message, sir? Amen. You guys remember that gummy bears? Who remembers the gummy bears? Bouncing here and there and everywhere. Every time I drink one, I think of that. Remember the little thing that gave them power to bounce? They would drink a little potion thing? That was free. That's, that's not in my, actually it is in my notes. No. Amen. Right out of the gate in this letter, amen to Sardis, Jesus is telling them that they are a dead Church, look at verse 1. It says, And unto the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars, which we know that's the Lord. He made that clear, uh, I believe, in the first chapter. He said, I know that works, and that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. I can't think of a worse thing uh, for a church to be called than dead. I just can't imagine. Uh, this church here has a reputation of being alive and healthy, but inside they're as dead as a doornail. As I read the beginning of this letter, it, it reminded me of what Jesus said to the religious hypocrites of his day. Look at Matthew 23, verse 27. Matthew chapter 23, verse 27. Jesus said, Warn to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres. That's like uh, painted tombs in the, in the graveyard. They're painted, man, they look really nice, but there's dead man's bones inside. It says, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and, and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. You know, there's a lot of people that look super healthy physically, but man, inside they just eat nothing but junk and they're not healthy on the inside. I hate those people. For some of us, what we eat just shows. But I'm not going to let that slip into the message, but you need to be at the altar. Amen. <laughs> you know, the world and some Christians, I suppose, would look at like maybe a mega church as alive and thriving. They've created a name for themselves as healthy and vibrant. And just because you're large in size doesn't mean that you're not healthy. But it doesn't mean that you are healthy. What is it that makes a church healthy? Is it the numbers? No. <laughs> no. Is it, is it the media production that they put on? I mean, some churches got the media nailed down. No offense, guys. You're doing a great job. But some people got, I mean, they just got, you know, uh, we've got 13 plus thousand back there, you know, and there's churches that have like, you know, 100,000 in their media. Man, it really helps when you're doing big plays and stuff. That stuff's handy. Is it the encouraging message from the pastor that makes a healthy church? Is it, if he's got an encouraging message for every message? No. Say, Pastor Gunther, you haven't had an encouraging message lately, I know. <laughs> Is it a large youth program? No. A healthy church has nothing to do with quantity, but everything to do with quality. We could narrow that down a little bit on our scope, dial it that down. It applies to us personally, too. It's not the quantity of what we're doing, but the quality of what we're doing. I would rather have two people in the auditorium than 200 I would rather have two people that are serving God and, and they, 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 they sold out for the Lord. Because we can do more for the cause of Christ with two people giving everything they have to the Lord than 200 people that don't want to do nothing. Amen. Quantity just, just don't thrill me. It's encouraging when you got a house full singing, amen. That's encouraging. 
until church is over and you got 40 people upset with you over something. Quantity doesn't solve the problem, amen. amen. But quality is where it's at. Amen. You could look at a, at a man who's got the big house and he's got the shiny Cadillac, the beautiful wife, the yacht, all the toys. He, and, and it looks like he's got success in his life, but what we don't see, there might be a drug addiction, there might be alcohol, uh, miserable marriage, child abuse, spousal abuse, constant fighting in the home, the discontentment in the marriage, the misery, drowned in alcohol. Amen. Just because somebody has all those things doesn't mean that, that they're miserable. They might be the greatest Christian on earth and have all that. Abraham was a rich man. Job was a rich man. Amen. Being rich and having nice things doesn't mean that you're wicked, but just because you have all those things also doesn't mean that you're healthy. Amen. I'm just bringing that point out quite strong. The church in Sardis was like this. They looked good on the outside, but they were unhealthy. They probably had good numbers. They probably had some good programs, but they were still dead on the inside. You say, you can't say that. Yeah, we can. Jesus said they were dead. That means they were dead. Look at verse 2. He, 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 Jesus continued in the letter. He said, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. The church in Sardis was clearly pleasing God at one point in time. But he's making it clear that there's still apparently parts of the church that still have hope. I, I believe that the pastors uh, tell that, that Jesus is telling the pastor here to strengthen what you have that is right while you still can. That's in the DS, the DGV, the Dan Gunther version. Uh, verse 3, he says, Remember, therefore, how thou hast received... Uh, Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If, thou, if therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. This is not a good letter. Some of the other letters were, um, hey, this is where you're doing good. You're doing great here. You're doing great here. But this is where I have ought against you. This is the problem. Oftentimes with our children, that's where we do, hey, you're doing good here. You're doing good here, but son, you got to work on this. This is you're just falling short in this area. You're consistently failing here over and over. You're doing the wrong thing here. You're doing good here, but you're doing bad here. The church in Sardis, there's no compliments, just condemnation. But to the rebellious, sometimes there isn't no compliments. And I'm sure that there's going to be a whole church full, a whole big group of numbers in Sardis that are going to be like. Man, God's just angry at us for no reason. We're just serving God. He's angry at us for no reason. God says that they're dead, so they're dead. Amen. Verse 4, he says, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me white, for they are worthy. Amen. Turn to Titus chapter 1, verse 15. Keep your place in Revelation. Titus 1.15. Jesus literally says that only a few are even saved in this church. I, 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 I don't know the whole story of the church of Sardis. But in my mind, I picture something like Northridge. Excuse me being judgy, whatever. But I know that that used to be a good, solid, Bible-believing church, man. Their doctrine was good, and, and there was like revival meetings that happened over there. Uh, to Old Temple Baptist. And they grew and grew and grew. And they dropped Baptists off their name. And they, they compromised in the Bibles that they use. They became loosey-goosey on a lot of different things. Your youth program uh, now consists of smoke and a whole lighting system on the platform. That's what they have now. A lot of compromise. They're not healthy on the inside. They would appear to be. I picture churches like Northridge. Titus chapter 1 verse 15 says, Under the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled. Yeah. And unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and under every good work reprobate. Revelation 3 4 he says, Thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. You know, being defiled is associated with the unbeliever as opposed to white garments. 
are associated with the believer. The born again believer, those who have accepted Christ, amen. Turn to, uh, look, look back at our text, Revelation chapter 3, verse 4. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Look at verse 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. If that isn't a reference to those who are saved, then I don't know what is. They're going to be wearing white up in heaven. Now I'll jump over to Revelation 6, verse 9. Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. I'll tell you right now, it's going to be a short message. Don't get too excited, boys. We got some Mexican waiting for us. I know they can smell it already. If the sour cream didn't get ruined, I hope it's not. Did it seem okay? Did you try it? You'll be our tester. <laughs> it was out there for like 30 minutes. I hope so. <laughs> Jimmy, try it with you. But I just want to point out this white raiment here. Uh, Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. And when he had opened uh, the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season to their, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be filled. Who, who were wearing white robes here? Right. Say born again martyrs for the cause of Christ. Amen. That's not debatable. It's just what it is. They're born again believers that were martyred. To jump to Revelation chapter 7 verse 9. After this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the thrones and before the Lamb, look at this, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Those are saved folks. Look at the next verse. And cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and then the Lamb. Jump to verse 13. And one of the elders answered, saying to me, oh, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence come they? All right, he's going to answer the question. If there's any question, it's going to be answered right here. Look at verse 14. And I said to him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and look at this, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Um, I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb, amen. I'll tell you that right now. So in Revelation 7, he's talking about these white robes are saved, born-again believers. There's just no question. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 19, verse 5. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and uh, ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Check this out. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. Check this out. Look at the next verse. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed, look at this, in fine linen, clean and white. Now if there's ever any question who, who the bride is, it, it, right at the end of this it says, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. To me, it's crystal clear who the bride is. It's not New Jerusalem. It's the saints that are in New Jerusalem. In all the description of New Jerusalem coming down, there's no mention of it being arrayed in fine white linen. No, not even close. It's the saints are arrayed in fine white linen. Amen. Every time we see people arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, it is always, always, always born again believers in the book of Revelation. Why would it be any different? I don't think a piece of land is going to be robed, have a white robe hanging off of it. No. 
Lord willing, I'll preach a message on the bride of Christ soon. Amen. But back to our text, God is telling the angel or the pastor of the church of Sardis that there are still a few that are true born again believers in your church. He's saying encourage them. He's saying strengthen them up. Encourage who you got. So look back at our text. Look at Revelation chapter 3 verse 2. It says, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before the Lord. He's saying, I haven't found what you've done complete. He said, remember therefore how thou hast uh, received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Amen. Saints, wear white. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. Uh, uh, amen. Born again believers. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He, sa- he ends it by saying, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Turn to one more scripture and we'll close. 1 Corinthians 15, 9. 1 Corinthians 15, 9. These letters were written to the seven churches in Asia Minor. I kind of, you, you know, if we're going to be doers and not hearers only, if we're going to apply the word of God, if we're going to use it for what it is, a mirror to show us what we are, and we're reading these different churches and different types of churches, and we haven't gotten through all of them yet. But it begs the question, what kind of church is Hope Baptist? Which one of these aligns the most? But it's more than that. It applies, it's way more applicable than just the general church. Which one of these churches is us personally? Which one of these churches can we apply our lives and say, man, I'm actually more like this church, whether it's fortunately or unfortunately. And we haven't even got, gone through them all. Ephesus was faithful, but they lost their first love. There's a lot of the, the, the rate in Christianity and churches in America, and I'm sure in the world, when kids hit a certain age, they just leave. When they get 19, 18, 19, they're gone. Mom and dad might take them to church, but if their heart was never in it, they'd be gone. There's a lot that were faithful for a time, but they lost their first love. That was the church of Ephesus. And Smyrna, man, they kind of had nothing but encouragement to continue their faithfulness. God gave him a big two thumbs up. I think it was the shortest letter of all seven, if I'm not mistaken. It's just like, keep doing what you're doing. Amen. You're doing good. Amen. Bless God. And all the rebellious churches were like, oh, how come they got all the compliments? Because they're serving God and you're not. Then we came to the church of Pergamos. They were faithful. But man, they allowed the doctrine of Balaam to slip into the church. And man... Uh, whoever the, the, however that came about, I don't know if it was somebody that was teaching it or, or, or people being allowed to, to influence other people in the church. I don't know. But nonetheless, God, Jesus is holding the pastor responsible for this. There's a responsibility that I have at what is taught here. It's not willy-nilly anybody preaches at the pul- pulpit. It's not willy-nilly anybody can just teach out there. It's important. God, God called out Pergamos. Man, you, they were faithful, but they allowed the doctrine of Balaam in the church. Amen. And they had to answer for that. Amen. Thyatira last week was found faithful. But man, for some reason, and I don't know how, probably slowly but surely, that pastor allowed a Jezebel woman to come into the church teaching wrong, wrong doctrine, leading people astray. God's saying, hey, you're faithful, you're doing great in all these things, but I got something against you. You let this woman in the church and she's causing havoc. Jesus is calling them out on that. There's a responsibility. We don't just come to the house of God. We're not just Christian parents. We're not just Christian brothers and sisters in Christ just because we want to live our best life now. No, there's a purpose here. We're going to do something for the cause of Christ. Give the gospel out to our neighbors, to, our, to, to the community around here. Encouraging one another. It's not just, eh, we're hanging. No, no. And then we come to the church of Sardis tonight. Man, it's possibly, it's definitely the worst letter we've seen yet. He says, your church is dead. There's only a few believers still there. Strengthen the saved. Encourage the believers that you still have. 
Ouch. That hurts. Hmm. Philippians 1, 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that which he hath begun a good work in you will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. Our salvation is not some thing that can be just taken away from us. No, no. God gave it to us. And God ain't going to take it away. Amen. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 9, and we'll close here. Paul says, man, I, if I am the least of the apostles, then I'm not made to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Man, we'd all do good to just soak this up tomorrow. We're going to work. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but, but, but the grace of God, which was with me. Folks, the message is over. We're done. We got a thousand reasons to serve the Lord. A million reasons to serve the Lord. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Hey, we're gonna, we can serve more abundantly than we ever have. We got no reason not to. God's been so good to us. Who are we to complain about whatever little squabble we come up with? And we come up with them. Amen. We're going to get to heaven. We're going to look back and say, wow, how selfish we were. We complained about that. We didn't do that. I claimed this, but I actually didn't live up to it. We got a lot to answer for. We can look at these churches and they're applicable to us, and they're applicable to us. The question is, are we going to apply it? That, that's, are we going to be hearers or are we going to be doers? Do you want God to move in our life? Or do you just want to continue going about how we're doing? Do you want God to bless you in your life? I probably said it five times today. But the whole your best life now thing, look, That is so unbiblical. Amen. My best life now is after I physically die. Amen. Amen. Hands down. Amen. Hands down. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I love you, and I love your word. You're such a good